Hi everybody, it's Mr. Pollard. In this video, I'm going to be discussing uh, key concepts from a unit covering the topics of mitosis, meiosis, and cancer. So I want to start by comparing and contrasting mitosis with the process of meiosis. So the image here at the top shows the process of mitosis. This is normal cell division. So this is what's happening, for example, in your skin cells. Mitosis, we start with diploid cells. Diploid cells have two copies of each kind of chromosome. Two copies of chromosome number one, two copies of chromosome number two, all the way up through all 23 kinds of chromosomes that human cells have for a total of 46 chromosomes. Now, during the cell cycle, in G1, cells are growing. During the S phase, the DNA, the chromosomes, are going to be copied. So we see here the formation of sister chromatids. Then during G2, the cells are going to grow a little bit more. Finally, they reach M. That's for mitosis. This is the process of cell division. So the chromosomes are going to be evenly divided. The cell is going to split in two, producing two cells that are both diploid. Each daughter cell here is genetically identical to the cell that we started with. These cells are diploid. They have two copies of each chromosome type. They are genetic clones of the original cell. Now, this is similar but different to the process of meiosis that you see down below. Meiosis also starts with diploid cells. Those cells are going to grow. They're going to copy their DNA, meaning they copy their chromosomes. But then, after G2, those cells are going to enter into two separate rounds of dividing. So we don't wind up with two cells, we actually wind up with four. And those four cells, if we look at them carefully, one here, one here, one here, and one here, have only one chromosome shown in them, where the original cell had two chromosomes. This means that we're producing haploid cells that have only half the genetic information of what the original cell possessed. So next I want to define the term crossing over. Crossing over is a really, really important concept in meiosis because it leads to greater genetic variation. So what we see here, the process of meiosis, uh, we can see that they're showing neighboring chromosomes when we form these things called tetrads that are actually um, kind of looping around each other or uh, wrapping around each other. And we can see it maybe more clearly in this image right here that uh, when those neighboring chromosomes wrap around each other and eventually the chromosomes are lining up in metaphase one and then they're being uh, pulled apart in anaphase one, uh, that segments of neighboring chromosomes can actually trade places with each other. Now this is really important. How does this lead to more genetic variation? Well, let's say that this chromosome is the chromosome that wound up in an egg cell, and that egg was fertilized by a sperm, and it became eventually a child. Now, that child inherited this chromosome from their mom. Now, where do these genes come from? The little a, the little b, the capital C. Well, those genes actually came from both the mother's mom, that could be the white part of the chromosome, but the child also got genes from the mother's dad. That would be the blue part of the chromosome. So this is essentially a way of just adding more shuffling to the genetic card deck. Now, in addition to crossing over that was discussed on the previous slide, there are other ways that meiosis can lead to genetic variation. One important way is the the way that the chromosomes line up before anaphase 1 and anaphase 2. So we can see here uh, we show a cell that has four chromosomes in it. Uh, now this is one way that those chromosomes might line up during um, metaphase 1 and we can see that blue goes with blue and red goes with red so we wind up with these possible uh, combinations of chromosomes in the haploid gametes uh, the sperm or egg cells that are being produced by meiosis. But the chromosomes didn't have to line up like this. They could have lined up blue here, red here, red here, blue here. And this would lead to the production of haploid cells with different combinations of those blue and red chromosomes. Now this model here is showing us only two different chromosomes. Uh, remember there are two copies of each chromosome type. 
in a real human cell, we would have to show one set of chromosomes, a second set of chromosomes, all the way through 23 sets of chromosomes. So the number of different ways that we could line up those chromosomes in metaphase one, uh, leading into anaphase one, is just a huge, huge, huge number. And this leads to all kinds of genetic variation. And it's why we don't see two siblings who aren't identical twins. It's why they're not genetically the same. Be um, another way that we get uh, increased genetic variation because of meiosis is that the uh, male produces many, many, many sperm. And um, when fertilization is going to take place, there are many sperm that could fertilize the egg, but it's only one that's going to fertilize it, and this is a random process. So here we're looking at pros and cons, or advantages and disadvantages of sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction. So I'll discuss sexual reproduction first. Sexual reproduction does lead to high genetic variability uh, because of many of the concepts related to meiosis producing genetically unique gametes that was just discussed in the previous slide. Uh, now this is going to help adaptation. If there's more genetic variation, a species can uh, adapt to their environment by evolving more rapidly so we can speed the process of evolutionary change. Now there are some negatives associated with sexual reproduction. Uh, it does require a lot of energy. Uh, courtship, when males are trying to attract female mates and many species, this is very time consuming, uh, this is resource consuming, and in some species uh, there may actually be some sacrifices made to the fitness of one sex. For example, male birds. Many male birds are very brightly colored. If we think about this, that would actually make them stand out to predators. So why are they colored like this? Well, the original theory that Darwin came up with about sexual selection basically said that female birds would be more attracted to these brightly colored males because they must have a really high fitness if they can survive even though their coloring makes them easier targets for predators. So they must have a good set of genes and uh, the females are attracted to them because of that. Now, if we look at the process of asexual reproduction, it does require less energy because you don't have to go out and look for a partner. All it takes is a single organism and they are able to reproduce. Uh, now, there are some drawbacks, some negatives. There's less genetic variation produced during asexual reproduction. Sometimes it's taught that these are all clones, so they're all completely genetically the same. There's still the possibility of mutation, so there's still going to be variation, uh, just not as much as we get from sexual reproduction. This is going to make it harder for species to evolve and adapt to their environment. Although with many species that uh, do carry out asexual reproduction, uh, we sometimes see them reach reproductive maturity much faster. In bacteria, this might take only half an hour before a new bacteria cell is going to be capable of reproducing. We also see these species that reproduce asexually very often produce just huge, huge, huge numbers of offsprings. So there are um, making efforts here to uh, try to counteract some of the negative drawbacks that asexual reproduction has. Now the next concept I'll talk about is, uh, seems pretty basic, why are cells small? Why do they need to divide? Uh, well we need to understand the relationship of surface area to volume. So if this is a model cell, okay, we can see that there's quite a bit of surface area. Uh, these are areas that are exposed. And uh, in a cell, this is the membrane. Now the membrane is really important in cells. It determines what's going to pass into the cell and what's going to leave the cell. So it's regulating movement of materials into the cell. That would be nutrients or supplies that cells need. It's also regulating the movement of materials out of a cell that the cell doesn't want. Uh, for example, wastes like carbon dioxide uh, that cells are producing when they carry out the process of cellular respiration. Now if we have a really large cell, the drawback is that there's not as much surface area to the amount of volume. Think about this. If I can reduce the size of this cell, I'm going to expose more surface area. So look at this blue cell right here. Okay, A lot of it right now is locked on the inside of this arrangement. But if I can make a smaller cell, now 
I have much more surface area that's going to be exposed. Remember, surface area is membrane. More membrane space means that the cell is going to more effectively move materials in or out by the process of diffusion. So there's a balance for cells. They need to be small enough so that they can diffuse materials in or out that they need or they need to get rid of, uh, but they need to be large enough still to fit the machinery, the cell parts, things like a nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, all those cell parts that you learned about, they have to fit on the inside of the cell. So that's why they're not infinitely small, but it's uh, also important to recognize that that surface area to volume relationship explains why cells don't get really big either. So it's important to know the stages of the cell cycle in order. I'll start uh, with a mnemonic. I want you to remember IPMAT uh, or IP, IPMAT. You can say this in different ways, uh, but you want to remember those letters in that order. Uh, now the first stage or phase that I'll talk about is interphase. This is not part of mitosis. It's the time that cells spend in between cell division cycles. During interphase, the cells are going to grow. They are going to copy their DNA. Now, if you're looking at microscope slides, key things to look at would be find the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus is typically going to look um, one consistent color. Uh, sometimes you'll be able to see a darker, smaller dot on the inside of the nucleus, which is the nucleolus, where ribosomes are put together. The next phase we'll talk about is prophase. Pro means beginning, like, a, like the prologue of a book. Uh, prophase is the beginning phase of mitosis. During prophase, what we see happening is we still have a visible nucleus. However, the appearance of the nucleus starts to look more spotted or blotchy. And this is because the chromatin is actually condensing to form those uh, visible chromosomes that we're going to see more clearly in the upcoming phases of cell division. So next we have M for metaphase and I like to remember that in metaphase the chromosomes are meeting or they're lining up in the middle of the cell. So M is for meet, M is for middle. So we see chromosomes lining up at the middle of the cell uh, and we see spindle fibers going off to each side. Eventually those spindle fibers are going to pull the chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell. Next we have A. A is for anaphase, and I like to remember that anaphase is when the chromosomes that are lining up at the middle of the cell during um, metaphase are being pulled apart to the two opposite sides of the cell. So anaphase is when those chromosomes are being pulled apart by the spindle fibers. Next up is T. T is for telophase, and this is when those chromosomes have been pulled apart to opposite sides of the cell. We see that in the image here and here. Now those chromosome groups are daughter nuclei. So there's one nucleus here, shown in the lower right, another one here in the upper left. Uh, those chromosomes are going to have a new membrane form around them, so each of them will become a new nucleus. Eventually the cell is going to divide and form two new cells. Uh, the actual division of the cell, uh, we give a different name for that process. It's called cytokinesis. Cyto means cell. Kinesis means to divide or to split. Cytokinesis means the splitting of the cell. Cytokinesis can actually begin, uh, can start earlier on in the mitosis process. Uh, the cell division cycle is not complete until the cells actually split. So in this slide we're considering what happens to cells if there's a mistake that happens in the cell cycle. So there's actually a number of different possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that if there is an error in the cell cycle, uh, this can lead to the formation of benign tumors. Now, if you had to have a tumor, the benign tumor is definitely a better one because uh, this is not considered to be cancer. These are abnormal growths. They certainly can have negative impacts on health, but they typically don't spread. Uh, they're going to be uh, able to be removed a lot of times using surgery or they can be managed using other medical uh, interventions. Malignant tumors, and we see an image uh, here of an x-ray of some individual who has lung cancer, and malignant tumors, these are cancer 
uh, tumors, which means that the cancer can spread to other parts of the body. Uh, another possible, possible thing that can happen is something called apoptosis. This is um, very commonly called programmed cell death or cell suicide. Sometimes what happens is a cell does have an error. Uh, there's some kind of mistake. There's something wrong with the cell. It actually has ways to recognize that it has problems and it can actually cause the cell to uh, trigger a process which makes the cell self-destruct. It commits suicide. And you might think that sounds really odd, but you have to remember that our body has trillions of cells. So if you have one skin cell that has a problem and that skin cell says, it's the end of the story for me. I need to commit suicide here. All your other skin cells are fine. And uh, this is actually good because it means that that one cell that had a problem is not going to become a tumor. It's not going to become a cancer. Um, so there's a lot of research that's being done to better understand the process of apoptosis because sometimes when people get cancer, uh, there must be something that is going wrong with this process that should find these errors and get rid of those cells that have problems. All right, everybody, thanks for watching this review of mitosis, meiosis, and cancer. I hope it was helpful.